Welcome to Green Gotham. I'm Lou Blaustein, and I want to thank viewer Andrea Learned all the way out in Seattle. She shared on our Facebook page how she's working with corporations out in the Pacific Northwest to tackle climate change. Good job, Andrea. Now, joining us, and this is a real treat, we have George Packenham. George is an anti-idling activist. He is also producer, director, and star of Idle Threat, Man on a Mission, a documentary film. This is going to be fun. <laughs> George, thank you for joining us on Green Gotham. Thanks for having me, Lou. So before we get into our chat, I would love to run a clip from Idle Threat that will give the viewers a flavor of the film. So, roll tape. There's lots of idling going on of internal combustion engines that we are dead set against. Engine idling is, is, uh, is really like secondhand smoke. The law says you can't idle your engine for more than three minutes, but the law is not being enforced. It has become unacceptable practice to park your car and leave your engine running. Our children's lungs can no longer afford motor vehicles being used as personal climate control devices. We have to get people to turn their engines off. What do you intend to do? George, how did you get to this point of, ma of making a film about idling or and the anti-idling laws in New York City? It's a long and deep story, Lou. Um... The, the origin of it goes back to 2005 or thereabouts. Um, at that point in time, I'd lived in New York City for 25 years. Love New York. Think uh, only the best for it. And um, right about that time, began to see, um, in my own neighborhood in particular, that uh, drivers of trucks, buses, and cars were just at curbside letting the engine run. And this is overlaid with um, my feeling at the time um, that the war in Iraq was primarily for oil rather than any other reason and that really started to gnaw at me and at the same time my brother my younger brother developed stage 4 lung cancer very quickly so all these things sort of came together and for the longest time I just didn't know what to do I didn't know how to address the feelings that I had and so maybe stirring this around for six months, it, it, it occurred to me that I should do something. And one night coming home from having dinner with some friends of mine, came around the corner from where I live on the Upper West Side, and there was a long stretch limo. The passengers had already exited uh, into the restaurant to eat. The driver was there. The engine was on. And I just, it boiled up inside me, and I walked up and rapped on the window and asked them to roll it down. And, we had this 20-minute conversation about his behavior and the ecology in New York City. And he kept the engine on during he that 20 the minutes? On. And then ultimately, I asked him to shut it off, and he goes, oh, well, sure, and did so. And it was an epiphany for me, because I didn't know what to do before, and I, it came to me that that's all I needed to do was ask people to shut their engines off. Well, I'm in sales, and you got to ask for the order. you got to ask for the order. And in this case, <laughs> asking for the order is turn it off. <laughs> yeah. And, and so uh, I was empowered. And so as I went to work down on Wall Street every day and came back, I'd do that. And then I started doing it at lunch, going out. And it was so, there was so much of it downtown on Wall Street and uptown. So you would go out at lunch and just go like, and then people would roll down their windshield yeah. and just. Yeah, and I'd ask them, but the whole time I was doing this, I, I, I didn't know that there was a law against it until one night I asked someone to roll There ought to be a law. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was an undercover cop. No. Yes, it was an undercover cop. He says, get away from me. I'm on the job. I'm, a, I'm an undercover policeman. I went, absolutely. So I walked away, and he said, stop, come back. I went, I'm in trouble. <laughs> you can't make this up. I came back, and he goes, you know something? There's a law against what you just said. And I don't know about the law, but I know there's a law against it. So I'd encourage you to check it out. And I went, a law against it? So for six months, Lou, I was doing this without even realizing there was a law against it. Started to look at the, on the web and other sources and found out about the law that had been around since 1971. So who uh, was enforcing this law? So 
I went to the EPA and chatted with some gents there and got to the base, the, uh, the base of it and actually learned that Elliot Spitzer had started to do, deal with the program to try to enforce it. But was he the attorney general at the time? Or he, the, he, he was or the, the attorney governor, general. Governor. He was governor for like two minutes. Yeah, <laughs> he was the attorney general. And I got, got into that office a little bit. Um, and, and then I realized now that I knew about the law, I would want to develop a tool. So I had a business card developed that had the law on one side and then printed on the back side was the, were the penalties that applied to the law. So I began to use that as a tool. I'd rap on the window, ask them to roll the window down. I'd say, are you aware in New York City it's, there's a law against idling and you've been idling more than, one, uh, more than three minutes at that point in time, <coughs> a three minute max. And I'd get some sort of strange response. And then I'd use the, the business card as an education device and hand up to them and say, you can read about it and you go to the web, but please shut your engine off. And I found myself more and more successful. And when I began with the, the printed card, I said, I must keep a record. And so I developed an Excel spreadsheet. If you're a Wall Street guy, you got to have metrics. You got to have metrics. So uh, that was sort of a natural thing for me to do. And so the, the metrics had the date and the location, um, the sex of the individual, the, the, the race, uh, the location, and whether or not they knew about the law. And then I also had a comments section, and Lou, the comments that the people gave me were just off the wall. I mean, I mean, did you get, uh, I, as I'm watching the movie, as I'm, as I'm hearing you talk, I'm thinking there were some people who might not have really liked it that you were telling them to turn their engine off. Yeah, in the film, there are some right moments yeah. and some moments of jeopardy, but I always felt like I had the upper hand because they didn't know who I was and I knew that they were breaking the law. So how aggressive can they get? They're not in a very strong position. So, you know, I, I never felt endangered, so to speak. Maybe once or twice it got hot, but that's, that's about it. That's amazing that, oh, how, many, how many of these encounters did you have? Well, I, I wanted to be very systematic. So uh, the first year I had more than 800 encounters. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and then it diminished after that for various reasons. I had a lot of business travel. Uh, for a couple of years. <clears throat> um, but over the course of five years, it was a five-year study where I kept records. I did it over 2,900 times. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, so I, I wanted to have a, you know, a, a scientific approach to this. So, so I, I need to take a step back because this is heavy-duty activism. This is bordering on Virgil vigilantism. Did, was this in your background? Were you a, a, a wild-eyed radical? No. Um, you don't seem it. No, no, I wasn't a wild-eyed radical, but I was in college during the Vietnam War. And, you know, it, it's an interesting, you're, you're touching on an interesting question because many of my friends were vehemently opposed to the, the war. I was opposed, but I was never in the street. And that always bothered me. I never went out to the street to protest it. And so maybe deep, 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 this was sort of something that I was digging up from that This is the most delicious irony of all. Not only are you out in the street, you're changing the street. <laughs> well, you're changing the way people behave in the street. Well. So, okay, so you're doing this, you're doing this over five years, and you're meticulously recording the, the encounters. How does this become a movie? <sighs> well, in the, in the 80s, I shot and directed um, and produced television. Uh, as a volunteer at Riverside Church, as a matter of fact, at 120th Street. They had a very elaborate program, and I was involved, so I learned the trade. And I did a documentary film during that time, so I had something to lean on. But um, uh, after I started keeping records, and I saw how successful I was, I was 80% successful. I mean, put me on the, on the baseball diamond, right. and I'd be in the Hall of Fame. So You'd so, own the Hall of Fame. I don't, and so I said, this has the makings of a documentary film because I don't know what's going to happen ultimately, but the reaction, the human element of it had, had the component. So um, when one day I shot a demo, and then I used the demo with uh, nine months worth of st statistics to go to various nonprofit, well, first City Hall, they didn't care at all. Um, and then the DOT, they didn't care at all. And then I was Department going, of Transportation. Yeah, Department of Transportation. And then I went to some nonprofits, and believe it or not, they didn't care, except ultimately the Environmental Defense Fund. And I found a home there, 
and dealt with the attorneys there. You, you found a champion there. Uh, uh, incredible. Isabel Silverin's one, one of the stars of the film, uh, if not the star, in my view. And she is just a fireball of enthusiasm for all things ecological. And uh, we vowed to work together to make this happen. So there is this law, but was any, no one was enforcing it. Well, that or was very the, little enforcement. Yeah, that was the whole thing. I, it was hard to get a handle on, on who was supposed to enforce it. Um, but digging and digging, it was actually the criminal side of the police department that was responsible for enforcing it. And imagine their responsibilities that are so monumental. I mean, they just don't care about some... It should be a traffic cop. You'd think so. And so, it, as the movie portrays, we filtered into the office of Dan Gorodnik, who's one of the... Uh, a long-term council person on the Upper East Side, I think. Yes. And and we worked with Dan, and Dan came up with Bill 881A, and 881A said traffic cops are on the on the beat, on the street, boots on the ground, and yes, they should enforce the law. And so, this took about oh, a year to put together, and in February of 2009, Mayor Bloomberg signed into law three different bills, um, one that would one that would reduce the three-minute limit in a school zone to one minute idling. Uh, the other one was to allow um, sanitation officers and park officers to write tickets. And the third one was to have um, uh, a monitoring, a financial monitoring once a year of all fines issued and dollars raised. Because I would imagine if these were actually, if these laws were enforced, there would be a big, a big boon to the city coffers. It's, it's amazing as is Miss Silverman on the on testimony at City Council? Um, uh, she gave testimony in the winter of 2009, prior to the bill being signed, and the numbers that that were put together as a result of her analysis were 4.6 billion dollars. 4.6 billion dollars that could be raised if all the traffic agents got out on the street and began issuing tickets at she, the rate you were doing, at, at a $220 uh, per ticket rate, 220. She, it raised $4.6 billion, which is a staggering sum of money. And then at the same point, the carbon emissions reduced and the benefits to public health would also be significant. Is there a metric for that? Well, I know hard to measure. But. Well, um, an interesting metric that came out after the film was, was, uh, was distributed was the fact in 2012, there were 400 homicides in New York City and 3,000 deaths associated with air quality and air pollution. So that's a staggering metric because you think of New York City and the homicide rate. No, no, no. It's the air pollution problem and the death rate associated with air pollution that is the more critical one. And you and enforcement of the law would help reduce that. It would have to. So Bloomberg signs three laws. And if you, if you see the film, you'll also see he was, his vehicles were <laughs> idling. Yeah. Yeah. And, but that changed. Yeah. So then what happened? Well, just a, a caveat, Bl Bloomberg signed in, into, into uh, law three, di three bills, but Dan Gorodnik's bill, 881A, was never brought to city council for a final vote. vote. It was sort of like pushed away and pushed aside. Why is that? Because the police department didn't want to have city council make them and make it mandatory for them to go out and begin this, and they wanted to put it on their own shoulders. and, and uh, we worked with then Chief Michael Scagnelli, who ran the traffic side, and Bloomberg signed the, the bill in, in the bills in February. In May, on Earth Day, I think it was Earth Day, Mr. Scagnelli came out and said, "Okay, so now we're going to do it on our own, and we'll start writing tickets on this." <laughs> and he resigned three weeks later. So there was this void, uh, which was very frustrating. Because then the person who comes in after him doesn't own it. That's right. It's not his thing. That's right. So I would imagine there weren't that many tickets issued or what happened? So <clears throat> I continued to track it and and I'm not alone in this. There, are, I have allies in this on this particular issue. Um, As shown in the film, there's a woman who independently of you started doing uh, something similar. How did that happen? Uh, well, you're talking about Barbara and I can't t tell you what her last name is out of privacy. That's fine. Uh, but at the time she was 79 years old and she read an article about me in the New Yorker magazine and she called the New Yorker and asked to be con to have contact with me and she did and we spoke and I went to her apartment and I and she wanted 
cards. Uh, I had cards made, as you know, as I said. And she wanted some of those cards because she, as, at 79 years old, was out there knocking on windows and telling people, asking people to shut their engines off. And we had this wonderful relationship still to this day. Um, That's fantastic. Yeah, I've been at her place plenty of times, she and her husband. So, so what happened with the not mandatory policy and how were how many tickets were issued and is that still ongoing and is it or is it kind yeah. of diminished? Very good question. So, uh, keeping track, as I'm wont to do, uh, in 2010 there were uh, over 2,800 tickets written. Uh, and that was with the traffic agents, the New York City Police, and the DEP. Uh, Were you happy with that number? or Well, I thought it was a, big, a start. So you thought that's, it's going to have an uptick, uptick from there. But yet, a year later, the figures came out, and there, was 20, there were 2,300 tickets written. And a year after that, there were 1,700 tickets written. And last year, there were 209. So it's been a colossal failure, as far as I'm concerned, with that particular approach the voluntary approach. Do you think it would have been markedly different had it been mandatory? It's hard to say. So, okay, so the movie's out. You also have a, a companion children's book. I have a companion children's book. It's called Big Nose, Big City. And it, it takes a view of the, of the same problem, but uh, the story is told through the, the eyes, ears, and nose of a bloodhound dog named Cyrano. Uh. Yeah, and uh, it shows his his coming of age on this particular issue and what happens with him. It's a bit of an adventure story. And what age group is it appropriate for? I I, I consider it a read to book, so an adult would be reading it to a three year old or a four year old. If, Got it. You know, and so the movie's been out, the book has been out, the arrests are declining. So where are you with this now? And where are we going? At a very good and interesting spot. Lay it on me and the audience. Uh, um, an interesting thing happened a year ago in April, uh, that there was another idling bill out at city council, and I was asked to read it and testify about it, and it was a weak bill. And so I expressed that it was a weak bill, and um, at a city, count city council testimony, and. But by being there at this particular time, I got to know some very key people at, at rather high levels in, in government and satellites within government. And various conversations took place. And at that time, the, co the consensus was perhaps there should be a citizen's arrest component to the bill. A citizen's arrest component. Okay, so when I hear those two words together, citizens and arrest, I, I can't help but think of Gomer Pyle. Citizens arrest. Citizens arrest. <laughs> that's, that's, that's exactly correct. So, but what was weak about the city council bill that was being considered? Oh, it's, it, it, it put uh, temperature factors in. If it was too cold, it was okay to let it idle. Things of that, along that. So nature. there were loopholes. Loopholes. So, but it seems to me that the city council president, uh, Viverito, she is pro your cause because she was in the movie. So I would think she would have a strong, Ve very good, a strong a, bill. Very good. And Miss Viverito is in in the film, and she's a she's a, a proponent of the of a, a stronger idling law, and um, and so she, I would consider her an ally. But let me tell you what has happened since, because it gets much much better. My council person is Helen Rosenthal, representing the Upper, Upper West Side West. of Manhattan. My council person, too. There you go. Isn't she great? Yes. A and so uh, it was, the thought was that office should see my film. And I gave them copies, and they did, and I got a very good feedback. And then I presented a PowerPoint uh, to Helen that, that laid it out as to how this might work. And it was one of the more interesting meetings of my life because by page four she goes, "Stop me! You had you have stop. You had me at page one, and I'll do what I need to do to start moving this forward." And I went, "This is terrific." So Helen became a great ally, and I did, I think the world of her. And she is a mover and a shaker. She is. She's absolutely fabulous. And so, um, fast forward this to this March of this year, and Helen and Donovan Richards, who is the chairman of the ecological committee at City Council. We're on the steps of City Hall introducing Bill 717, Intro Bill 717, which allows for citizens 
um, who are ecologically minded, of course, and want to go through the effort and have an iPhone to submit video evidence of those that are idling more than three minutes, generally speaking, and one minute in a school zone to submit that evidence to the DEP. And that evidence is a form of, um, of proof that there's been a violation. A ticket is then issued. The ticket's paid. Uh, the fine itself is $350. So it's gone up. It's uh, from 220 to 350. So there's real teeth in it. And the citizen who submits the evidence is paid half. So $175 per citizen's arrest. <laughs> per, you know, that, that combination of those two words is probably going to get us in trouble. Right. <laughs> per citizen action. Yeah, action. Involvement. Citizen action. Yeah, and engagement. Yeah. Yes. But I love how you say citizen arrest. Hey, I've been sitting on that for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, do it 10 times a day, you're making $1,750 a day, and you're, and you're cleaning up the area, the, your neighborhood, and you're doing something that by clear evidence, the city doesn't want to do, the police don't want to do, the DEP, eh, when but, they want to. So you would have to show, and, and forgive me for being maybe literal on this, but ha you, do you have to show your, you have to have your iPhone on for three minutes or more to show that they are violating the law. That's correct. And, but it's only one minute in a school zone, so you right. can imagine that's not a great... That, right. This, people are going to be out at schools yeah. doing this. So, okay. So, this is the, the bill that's... Where does it stand now? Okay. So, as I'm hearing, uh, there should be a hearing on it in September. Uh, hearing leads to a vote. Vote, hopefully, will be passed which leads to uh, Mr. de Blasio signing the bill. And where is Mr. de Blasio on this? Well, <clears throat> I, at this particular issue, I don't know. But as you may or may not know, last fall, or was it early winter, uh, city council, uh, with Mr. de Blasio's blessing and signature, signed a bill to eliminate uh, emissions in the city of New York by 80% by 2050. Right, that's eliminated like eighty percent by two thousand fifty. That's extraordinary. Right, that's taking Bloomberg's Plan YC, which was thought of as extraordinary, and now I believe it's one YC, which is De Blasio, who, when he was running, I wasn't so sold on him on this issue. <laughs> yeah. But I got to say, on this issue, he's been great. Now it would be interesting. It is going to be fascinating because this is a really quick way to get towards that 80% reduction I think so. by this law. I think so, for sure. And, and the interesting thing is that, that there'll be incentive, you know, really a robust effort will probably take place because people will now, they'll have, they'll have a vehicle to express themselves and to, to bring this evidence to the right people and tickets are issued. And unfortunately, sometimes a stick is the best way rather than a carrot. So where are you in all of this? Are you helping lead the council, uh, you know, the push in the council because you have a bit of a kind of a name in this? Um, I, you know, I don't want to boast or something like that, but, you know, I think I have some influence since I did the I think the only documentary no, film ever on No, absolutely. Idling. I don't think it's boasting. Yeah. It's just I'm just saying how are you kind of in the mix? Yeah, I, I, I am keeping abreast of this whole issue and, and um, actually uh, have written a series of questions to certain people that can supply interesting answers to sort of watch this thing materialize and to almost like a checklist of, of uh, questions that might fall under the cracks, fall into the cracks and not be answered prior to the bill being fully uh, addressed in, the, in September. So I'm almost monitoring it as, as things move along. And then is there another movie in your future or another, you know, another issue that you want to tackle or are you going to ride this maybe into other markets? Well, um, I've written three other versions of the, ch of the children's book. So I just haven't gotten to press with them yet. So that's already written. So that's sort of fun. Um, the film ha has been into, in five film festivals, uh, including the Environmental Film Festival of our nation's capital in Washington, D.C., which was a great, yeah, that was terrific. And uh, the Wild Scenic Film Festival in California last January, and 400 people saw it in one sitting, which was absolutely uh, terrific. Um, and, and just this week learned that it's going to go on in 
internet film festival based out in California worldwide. When, Speaking of California, when you think of the idling in a place like, I don't know, Los Angeles where everybody drives, I mean, I, I'm just doing some quick math in my head. Um, I mean, there is a lot of impact that can be made, both in terms of people making money, but also in emission savings. And if, if other cities, you know, get the idle threat religion. Well, I agree with you. And, and to wit, as you mentioned, California, California, Jerry Brown just came forth with a bill that mimics the New York City bill, 80% reduction by 2050. They just came out with that within the past 30 days. So who came first? New York came first. California came six months later. I think that's an interesting statement. What makes a good anti-idling vigilante as we are getting close to wrapping up? <laughs> well, you have to have passion for the, for the city. In, as it pertains to New York, you have to have passion for the city. And you have to be ecologically conscious. Um, and, you know, have no fear uh, to approach people in this in a particular manner, but given the new bill coming out, the 717, you don't have to approach people like I did in the movie. You want to make some money. Yeah, the, you, want to, you want to make some and, money, and, and, and it's done surreptitiously, so no one you, knows. And that is fantastic. That's the beauty of it. And this is a beautiful story. And George, thank you for sharing it. Thank you for watching Green Gotham. If you have your own stories to share about your own environmental a activism, go to our Facebook page and share them. And see you next time on Green Gotham.